I'm not sure. There we go. Woo. Now is that, is it working? Is this one working? Yay, we did it, we did it. Thank you. I'm Wendy Ritten, I'm a retired pastor from Oshkosh and I'm here to join you this morning. Many of you know who I am. And uh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, I could finally breathe and I actually got a little chilly during the night with the windows open, but wasn't it perfect, it was beautiful. So again, welcome to worship. Please stand and we'll continue with our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for the life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. Let's sing. <coughs>
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, we implore you to hear the prayers of your people. Be our strong defense against all harm and danger, that we may live and grow in faith and hope. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated for the readings. Our first reading this morning is from Lamentations 3. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for one to bear the yoke in youth. To sit alone in silence when the Lord has imposed it. To put one's mouth to the dust. There may yet be hope. To give one's cheek to the smiter and be filled with insults. For the Lord will not reject forever. Although he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love, for he does not willingly afflict or aggrieve anyone. The word of the Lord. Thanks 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 be to God. I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up and have not let my enemies triumph over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you, and you restored me to hell. You brought me up, O Lord, from the dead, and you restored my as I was going down to the Excel in everything in faith and speech, in knowledge and utmost eagerness, and in our love for you. So we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command, 
but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you may become rich. And in this manner and matter, I give you my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something. I now finish doing it so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if <clears throat> the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, <clears throat> Excuse me. not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. The word, word of the, of the Lord. Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, named Jairus, came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under the physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came to the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother to those who were with him and went in there where the child was. He took her by the hand and said, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the Gospel of the Lord. 
Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. All of the readings today rally around one big message, which is no two people are indifferent to God, whether they come from an upper crust or the lowest level. And in the Middle East, back in Jesus' day especially, but it is still that way today, there is a very upper class and there's everybody else. There's not a lot of middle ground. A lot of countries suffer from that. Um, I went to India some years ago and it was that way there. They had the upper class, they had a very tiny middle class, and then there were the Dalits, the lowest of the low. And as in Jesus' day, the lowest of the low could not even touch an upper class person in any way, touch their clothing, you know, interrupt them, talk to them, speak with them. That was all not done, right? It is sad. But it reminds me of the way God has worked in my own life. Um, I, was, I was a church baby. <laughs> I was obsessed with going to church and going to Sunday school and going to confirmation. I loved the church. My family raised me that way. Um, my mom was church secretary. My dad was on council all the time. And we just loved being a part of the church. It was a different era. I know not everybody feels that way, but I was a geek, a church nerd. And um, it suited me because somehow I knew as I walked my walk in life, that there was something different about life in the church. Something very different. Now, when I was a teenager, um, in, I grew up in Fort Atkinson, mostly. Um, when I was a teenager there, it wasn't a middle school thing. It was uh, elementary, junior high, and senior high. Not all communities do that, but they did. <laughs> and in junior high, uh, our disabled children at that age had a wing of the school <coughs> and never came out. Those kids were always in that wing. They never came out. They didn't eat with us in the cafeteria. They ate in their own place over there. We never saw them, ever. But somehow or another, there was a little thing called mainstreaming kicked in. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mainstreaming began in Fort Atkinson between the summer between my ninth grade and senior high, sophomore year. There you go. There you go. And for me, being uh, raised in the church, I had a great understanding of um, these young children that were being pushed into regular normal classrooms on purpose. And there was a big fuss about it. A lot of kids were not kind to those kids that were in wheelchairs or that had different issues or whatever. Um, yeah, it was disappointing. And the things that came out of that time were not pleasant and not, not good. Much like Jesus and the hemorrhaging woman. 12 years, she hemorrhaged for the same amount of time that child of Jairus's existed. 12 years, and yet there was nothing she could do about it. She spent all her money trying to find a cure, and it just didn't work. And the people around Jesus were like, she shouldn't be touching him. She shouldn't even be here. But she was, much like those students back in high school. They shouldn't be here, but they were. And how were we going to respond? Well, I remember walking to school. Uh, I lived three blocks from high school, three blocks from junior high, three blocks from the elementary school. I mean, I lived right in the middle of that, so I always walked. And on my way, there was uh, a young girl being pushed in her wheelchair by her mother to school. And a bunch of high schoolers walked by them, walked around them, and one of them took an apple out of his pocket and threw it at her head. Yeah. It was just like, how does this happen? It was the 1970s. It was supposed to be a good time, right? Right. <laughs> well, those things happened, and I'm ashamed to say that they were, they did. I mean, I, what are you going to do? 
But a couple of my friends and I, um, we were in choir, we were, in, we were all great singers, and we were in the highest choir. You had to audition to get into our high school upper, upper choir. Um, we went to ask our choir director if we could start a choir with the girls from the disabled handicap part. And he gave us permission. He said, sure, let's do that. So we recruited a bunch of girls that all had different voices. That all, some of them couldn't sing. It didn't matter. They wanted to. They loved singing. And so we invited them. And on the first day of rehearsal in the fall, the first day of choir class for those kids, my two friends and I came in to join them. And they all were like, what are you doing here? They couldn't believe that the cool kids were, and, and we were not the cool kids, by the way, but they thought we were the cool kids and what were we, what were we doing there? And we went and we sat amongst them and we sang with them and we had a great year together. And those kids became some of my best friends for a very long time. Jesus heals in the way we behave toward one another in the way we behave towards one another. Mainstreaming, everybody thought, was a big failure, but then as time went on, it was okay. It, it grew. I mean, it, it worked. And then I went to college for something called music therapy and became a therapist so I could help young people of that kind um, and kids that were uh, way beyond everybody else, the upper intelligence kids that were just real problems because they were too smart for their own good. Um, but I wanted to work with those kids. I wanted to help bring joy with music into their lives. And it was fun, and it was a struggle, and it was disappointing at times, but then the next day somebody, something would happen and God will, would smile on us again and have some miracle happen. I had a little girl that I was in charge of. She had brain cancer. She was eight years old. And she couldn't sequence. And they were kept trying to get her to remember things in order, in sequence. So they'd put five things on a table in front of her, and they would try and get her to, and then they'd mix them up, and they'd try and get her to put them back in the right order. And she couldn't do it, and she couldn't do it. But when I did it with her, I sang with it. I sang to her uh, a song that kind of went with the game we were playing. And as soon as she heard the song, she could do it. God was working through music to help her heart and her spirit. Um, she was not expected to live past 10 years old. I don't know what ever became of her. I wasn't there anymore. But I often thanked God that I was in the right place at the right time for that one child. For one child. Jesus is very clear. He is not going to discriminate against the lowest of the low or Jairus' daughter who was in the upper crust of his society. Wherever there is a need, Jesus lends a hand, which is why every once in a while he has to go away and be on his own to rest up so he could come back and do some more. And I think part of that is the mission of the church. Yes, sometimes we give too much or do too much, but rest up and then come back and pitch in again is what we're called to do. Jesus doesn't quit. He doesn't stop helping. He merely has to navigate his space and time, and he does it very well. You and I are called to do the same thing. We are called to navigate space and time in our own lives. And I'll tell you the one thing I often heard as a pastor that irritated me the most <laughs> It's time for somebody else to do this now. I've done it long enough. Somebody else can do it now. And I would say, well, okay, what are you going to do to replace that then? What, what are you going to do now? If you're going to stop doing this, what are you going to pick up? They didn't like that. <laughs> Not much. Ah, I'm an ordinary pastor. Always have been. But in essence, isn't that what we're called to do? I once suggested at a, a women's gathering, the uh, women of the ELCA, we met at, gathered at my church for our fall gathering, and I talked to them about the fact that 
how many people in that room, and maybe even in this room, have said, why don't the young moms and young women come to our Bible studies? Why don't they join us with the, the Welka, you know, things that we do? And I said, have you said that before? Worried about it before? And I said, why aren't you going out to them? Because they have, they're busy people, too. They work, they have children. Why are you expecting them to come here, but you're not willing to go where they are? And of course, I irritated people again. The interesting thing is for me in this, these texts and these readings is that there is supposed to be more equity in our lives. More equity. Even the Lamentations reading said, you know, the, the privilege, those who have much are not to have too much, and those who have little are not to have too little. We need to kind of narrow that gap. And when it comes to people, Jesus is the one that does it. And so I offer that as a message this morning for you and I to remember, even in retirement for me, I still find ways to reach out. I still find ways to help. And that's, that's what we're called to be about. That's what Jesus went to the cross for, so that we learn from that and understand that he never really leaves. He comes back on the third day, and here we are again. It never ends. And that's what life is, isn't it? Amen. Let's sing. <coughs> Stand if you're able. confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of God, and life everlasting. Amen. We come before the triune God to pray for our communities, ourselves, in our world. God of abundance, you fill your church with a multitude of gifts. Sustain those among us who feel they are not valued. Open our hearts to the wondrous breath of all who call upon your name. In your mercy. God of creation, your goodness abounds. Multiply the fruits of the earth and rescue it from our wastefulness. In your mercy. God of justice, you reign in steadfast love. Bring peace between nations ravaged by war or strife and illumine paths of justice and freedom for those who lead them. In your mercy. God of compassion, your touch brings healing and your word revives us for life. Hear our prayers for all who are in need and for doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers who provide care. Turn wailing into dancing and weeping into joy. We especially pray for healing and comfort for those on the prayer list. In your mercy, hear our prayer. God, a community, you gather us at your table of plenty. Where there is hunger among us, open our hands. Where we are indifferent to the needs of others, open our hearts. In your mercy, hear our prayer. God of the ages, great is your faithfulness. We remember in thanksgiving our beloved dead who will, with all the saints, sing without ceasing in your realm of glory. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, holy and merciful, into your outstretched arms we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And, and also with you. Peace be with you.
Please stand as you're able as we sing as the grains of wheat. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. The Lord be with you. indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you almighty and merciful God through our Savior Jesus Christ who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life and so with all the choirs of angels with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven we praise your name and join their unending hymn In the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He broke it and gave it for all to eat, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. And again after supper, he took the cup. He blessed and gave it for all to eat. Drink. Take and drink, he said. This is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this to remember me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us always to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, 
forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Christ has set the table with more than enough for all. Come.
And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace unto everlasting life. Amen. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. Gracious God, loving all your family with a mother's tender care, as you sent the angel to feed Elijah with heavenly bread, assist us in this ministry on which we are sent forth. In your love and care, nourish and strengthen those to whom we bring this sacrament, that through the body and blood of, our, of your Son, we all may know the comfort of your abiding presence. Amen. And now the blessing of God who provides us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. Let's sing. Go in peace. You are the body of Christ. 